Support for Short Stops is presented by the Kalem Trading Institute. Check out our website at www.kaleminstitute.com. On today's episode... I'm, I was like, okay, I'm going long-term already on this stock. <laughs> um, and that stock was COL Financial. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened was I turned 10 million bucks into 900,000. So the share price I was buying from 1450 to 1480 it went all the way down to 288. <laughs> <laughs> the company you lost money. <laughs> I learned. I really learned my lesson there. Um, Even in your own company, you yeah, can yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, does that? That's the worst trade I've ever made. <laughs> Call it what you want: a game, an experiment, a gamble. But stock trading in the global financial markets to us is a business. Every day you're surrounded by the noise. Buy, sell, hold, buy more. And we're going to quiet it down and filter out the best trading strategies, tips, and stock picks. You want information on how to find your next bagger or home run? You'll find it right here on Short Stops. Hi everyone, we're here for our 19th episode in Hong Kong. And for the first time, we were able to pull out all of our busy schedules and come all together. And we finally have Chairman, Mr. Edward Lee, here on the show. Hi. And Vice President of City Securities, Mr. Lawrence Lee. Hi, guys. Hi, Mom. So, how long have you guys been in the market? I've been in the market for almost 20 years. So, I started trading when I was 16. Um, I'm 30, obviously 36 now. So, um, almost 20 years. Almost 20 years in the market. And Chairman? Yes. Uh, 1973. So, it's 45 years already in the uh, in uh, in this business and uh, still learning. And how many markets do you guys participate in? Primarily, I actually <clears throat> only trade at night. I'm so busy with so many things in the morning that I don't really have much time to trade anymore. So at night's the only time I actually have the time to lock in where there's not too much noise and uh, everyone's asleep. So it's just me, the laptop and the market, right? So there's a lot more time to focus. There's a lot more time to be able to go and think about what I really need to do to be able to make proper execution. Um, the bulk of my time in the morning is actually spent on market preparation. So I spend a lot of time in the mornings really looking at charts, reviewing my trades, and I do all my planning mostly during during the afternoons actually. So I start around uh, after lunch, around 1.30 to prepare myself for the evening. So I trade the Philippines part-time. I trade uh, Japan part-time as well. So well, considering those two markets aren't really that strong right now, so they're generally part-time. But most of my time is really spent trading the U.S. at night. Okay, same as uh, Lawrence. I spend most of my time early in the morning. After market closes, I wake up about 4.30, 5 o'clock, and I start charting already for the U.S. market. So my, fo- my main focus is really the U.S. market. Uh, Philippines, when I come to the office, basically I spend a lot of time talking to, to traders, uh, talking to uh, some marketing stuff that I do for COL Financial. Uh, overall, I have basically one market, it's the U.S. market. From time to time, I will do some uh, position trading for the Philippine market and also for Japan market. So, s- secondary market for the Philippines and Japan. With over 65 years of trading experience combined be- behind both of you, what have you noticed and what has changed over the years? Yeah, I've, uh, especially over the past five years since we started Kalum, my trading is, has transformed tremendously. When I was, I was put in charge of the trading division in 2008, 2007, 2008, and before that, I was just a regular trader. And um, we started out as cowboys. Anything goes. As long as we make money, it doesn't matter what we do. And the problem there is that you build so many bad habits over that period of time. And we don't even realize the mistakes that we make throughout the whole process. And I think that's the biggest reason and that's the biggest change that we needed to make was when we started Kalum, we have to make sure that we can't just teach any single trade and we have to put everything on a piece of paper, right? Just because you make money, you think it's a good trade. And that's never the case. You have to look back and say, is this a trade that... I want to make again, that I would do again, that the thought process going into the trade was the right thing to do. But it still happens until now. uh, Absolutely. (laughs) It still happens until now, but it's a big change from that point until today, right? Um, A lot of the things that um, people think is that the best trade is always the one I made the most money on, and that's not actually the case. Um, You have to think about trading as, well, we always say that trading is a marathon, not a sprint, right? And the reason for that is because just because you make one good trade doesn't make every single other bad trade acceptable. 
you have to go back and see, is this a trade that I can make consistently over time? Because if you really want to make trading a business, it's got to be something where you can continuously repeat it and repeat it and repeat it again and again and again. Um, you'll see formations like uh, cup and handle or or all these reversal trades that people like. It doesn't mean that those trades are bad trades. It's just that if you go into the market thinking that every single day you're going to find a cup and handle or every single day you're going to find that reversal trade, it's impossible. The trades that we had to teach in Caleb, those are trades that if I had to go through a few hundred charts every single day, I could find at least four or five of them. And those are trades that you could execute every single day because this is our job, right? Yeah. I mean, I've never experienced the Wild Wild West. What was it, it back then during the 1980s to the 1990s? Chairman, 45 years ago, there was no internet back then. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I think I remember I used to use uh, try to use a point and finger, try to understand how uh, classic charting is all about. Uh, but uh, luckily, uh, in the early 80s, there already uh, there was a first Apple that came out, and uh, there was a program. So I've always been a system trader. Uh, the difference from today and from before is really just because, like what Lawrence has been saying, now it's more systematic. Uh, we really focus on risk first, profit second, if you're going to be able to sustain this business. And then, uh, luckily, by the late 1990s, the first online broker came about. So we have now uh, bigger markets to trade on, which uh, a lot of times that uh, the limitations of the Philippines, the liquid market here, and the different setup that we have here in the Philippines is very limited. So what is really good about uh, the world today is that uh, we have access to different markets and we can apply all the different uh, trading system or tra trading setups that we enjoy today. So I think most of the people who try to make it as fast as possible without knowing the rules, without having all these setups, I think the, it's always a challenge. 2008, we had the financial crisis. 1999, we had the dot-com. 1987, we had the Asian financial crisis. I've never seen any of them. But you guys have probably seen two or three out of those three. Uh, in 1987, I was there, right there. Because we're system traders, I can see the, the breakdown of in, the, in the market. And in fact, we, we were there for about a week waiting for it to break down. And it really broke down. We, so you were using moving averages already at those times? Yes, that's right. That's right. That's right. That, this is basically 1987 because uh, the first outlook, I think, came in in 1981-82. And uh, we were using moving average already to be able to determine the, the major breakdown. And when it did, th within two days, it was down 25%. And we were trying to catch the bottom. <laughs> and the, the problem is that, you know, we were, we were using the wrong instrument. We were using uh, futures. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I always say that there is a God. And uh, the gap down. And then <laughs> what happened was that uh, the, the market was stopped because of this, uh, what we call the uh, uh, deleveraging that was happening in the futures market. They stopped it for about, a, about an hour. Then the market started rallying. So we were just lucky. I was just we were just lucky to be able to uh, hold on to those issues. In 1997, 98, uh, on the financial crisis, we were very lucky because uh, we were able to avoid the drop. And uh, by the 1998, when the down move came, you know we were out of the market. So we were there was a chance for us to take advantage of it. By 2008, 2009, we're... I mean, Sanay na. Sanay na. You know, we're so used to it already. So we were able to capitalize on all these major capitulations and take advantage of it to be able to do well in the next, what, two, three months, you, you, can, you can harvest already. What's the worst thing you've ever seen in the markets? Like you were talking about how exchange closed down. What was the worst thing that you thought it was almost over? I think during the time when the Asian financial crisis hit, because it was a systemic risk for all of us here in the region, but that was the time that you can make a lot of money when uh, people are selling irrationally. So always in the crisis, when there are just major capitulations, you need to be there. You need to be able to take huge positions so that you know within the next two to three weeks, you can see absence of sellers. The rational selling will create that opportunity, especially in the Philippines. Because, because 1999 and 2008, the Philippines was never in a recession, right? But 1987 was a different case. Right. What was happening? Was it people selling property? Was it people were panicking? 1987, like I was always sharing with most of the traders, is that uh, the day that the, the market capitulated in the U.S., the, the market here in the Philippines did not much, did not do much, mainly because one week, uh, one month before, there was a coup d'etat, 
and the whole market was collapsing already. So there was really nothing. It was priced in already because uh, there's really no no more seller because uh, they sold it about a month ago. So that's what that's what we're saying is that you need to understand each of the market whether it's it's uh, pricing in already or not. Asian crisis is 1997, 98. Mm. Uh, it's a totally different picture already. Mm. Interest rates went up. It was a problem here in the in the in the region. So uh, that that one is really scary. For us, that one is really very scary because uh, we went down a lot, and uh, the whole region basically was uh, collapsing. Interest rates was going to the moon. By 2000 and 2000, and there's nothing wrong in the Philippines, so it was a much easier decision just to you know take huge positions. Lawrence, right. anything else? Right? Yeah, for me, I think that the biggest thing that I saw in 2002 and 2003, um, as well as 2006 and seven, was there was a huge uh, euphoria period that came about right before all of this came down, right? And it's normal that during tail ends of um, of any uh, bull market, there's always the that euphoria stage that we always talk about. So the irrational buying is coming in, and the people are paying ridiculous prices. Uh, in the dot com top period, we always joke around about uh, companies that anything with dot com in it went to the moon. You're talking about uh, in individual issues going to 200, 300 times PE that have no value whatsoever, right? Companies like Sense dot com, as in Sense, as you can smell the scent. Apparently, <laughs> you can smell the scent through the computer. Um, and th- these were things that were people were buying. It, it was it was like kids in a candy store. Um, in 2008, it was uh, right before the made that real major collapse was the Chinese index was what 90, 100 times PE. That's index. What people don't realize is that those are the extremes and the anomalies, and those are the periods that when they're going up, everyone feels like they're so good at the stock market. And then two to three months later, everyone's breaking even. Another two to three months, everyone's down 15, 20 percent. Sounds like a lot of ICOs today. <laughs> but on a personal note, what's the worst thing that ever happened to you? Worst thing that ever happened to me? Uh, Whether, was it during the crisis? Was it this during- was this was during the crisis? Um, so I talked I talked about the euphoria stage, and the reason why I this is I highlighted this so much is because I personally went through it. So in uh, two thousand five, six, and seven, I was basically able to turn my account up twelve times. Right, so if it was eight hundred thousand to ten million. Uh, during that period. And it wasn't because I was really good. It was because the market, I was just sitting in such a humongous bull market. And everything that I bought just went up. Um, And at the top of the market, I sold everything. But the problem was that there was nothing to buy. There were no formations to buy. It was, there was nothing. So what I decided was I took my 10 million in cash, 6 million in margin, and I bought the one stock that I went to every single day and I looked at their operations and this company was doing so well. And I was like, okay, I'm going long term already on this stock, <laughs> um, and that stock was COL Financial. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened was I turned ten million bucks into nine hundred thousand. So the share price I was buying from fourteen fifty to fourteen eighty, and because I, I went all the way in with with margin, and it went all the way down to two eighty eight. <laughs> <laughs> company you lost money <laughs> so i learned i really learned my lesson there um even in your own company you yeah, can yeah, exactly <laughs> <laughs> i didn't even realize that at that time you could a company who's doing so well could drop by 90 <laughs> percent but the insider no <laughs> uh, yeah does that that's the worst trade i've ever made <laughs> uh, chairman yeah well Mine was uh, in the mid '80s, where in uh, I saw copper prices going to the moon, and uh, there was this company that was the biggest copper company in the Philippines was not moving, and I started accumulating the stock. And uh, what stock was this? Uh, it's uh, Atlas Mining Corporation, and uh, I didn't understand that uh, the company was not making money, <coughs> even if the price was going up. But then uh, I presume that it's just a matter of time. What happened was uh, by the end of the day, it's about a later, two months later, the stock started moving. And I was so excited. I was so happy. And then uh, I remember I was going to Merrill Lynch. I was looking at the, the price of copper and gold and silver. I saw gold going to 480 at that time. Silver at all-time high, $11. 
and copper was 85 cents during you know from 65 to 85 cents so when I when I left you know I was so excited uh, early in the morning the next day I went to the Manila Stock Exchange I remember that and uh, and I saw the prices and I said there's something wrong because gold was down 440 silver was back to 7 copper was back to 85 65 cents and I said something's wrong with the quotation and I look at it and keep on looking at it and I said this is crazy <laughs> you know <laughs> what, what, what happened was that there was a meltdown after I left there was a huge meltdown and I said to myself I know keep on walking around and the people my, my people were just saying that you know you know the boss will probably start liquidating uh, his <laughs> positions which he has given for the last two months and they were correct because I couldn't I couldn't understand what happened so I liquidated all my positions I didn't lose money but that was the worst thing that happened to me and uh, not understanding what I'm doing not understanding uh, the company that I'm buying and you know the sad part is uh, I think I bought it about average about 13 14 pesos and six months later there was the biggest tech over in that company <laughs> it was uh, for me so that was probably the worst trade because uh, missing that opportunity it was uh, I think somebody bought it out at 65 pesos <laughs> so that for me was, uh, was the worst thing that ever happened to me but the problem there is that I got sick and uh, that was the reason why you know it took me a long time before I, I was able to recover I think it was the stress you know the hyper acidity that uh, happened to me. <laughs> yeah. what, my, my, my question to you guys would it be the worst trade if you bet the right size because I assume most of, like in your stories it was mostly all in and a lot of big ones bet, betting big sizes mm-hmm. if you bet the right size would it have still been the worst trade ever I think that's that's normally the case right everything about about trading is being putting yourself in the best position to replicate what you're doing right so if you're putting yourself in excess amount of risk at any given point in time, that normally changes the whole scenario, right? The biggest mistakes that people make is they, they believe that they want to go for the homers all the time instead of taking the singles. Um, that's something we stress every day on the floor is that if you're in a rush to make that money, what happens is that th- that money will never be yours in the first place. Um, it's because you can't afford to make a mistake. You have to be in a position where you can make a mistake. And if you put the right size in, it allows you to be able to say, okay, I put this proper size in. I know how much I'm going to lose if I'm wrong. And if you're wrong, you can actually live with it because you're prepared for it. <clears throat> Especially those who are new that go into trading and believe that it's so easy to fight out of a hole. That's, that's something you don't ever want to get into again. And that's why I told myself. The reason why I was able to get back from digging myself out of that hole is because one day I just told myself, I don't want to lose money anymore. And the moment that I told myself that during that period is the day that my portfolio started to perform again. I think like any other upcoming traders, it's always uh, exciting to be able to bet big on one issue and... Uh, See if you make it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's really the biggest problem. It's what we call ego trading. It's always very exciting, you know, when you're putting something in and it, it's... And then you make money out of it. The problem is that it's not sustainable. And uh, we have to go through those processes from time to time. It's called the investor's journey. Wherein you start as an investor. And it's, it's too slow that you started going to become a trader. Which is participating in a speculation. And after when you do very well in speculation. You decided that... Uh, you want to be a market maker or you want to be a market operator wherein you identify great companies and uh, try to maximize it. The sad part is that uh, you probably are going to do very well and then the last one will always be the one that uh, costs you a lot of uh, pain. And uh, so you can get stuck in an issue and uh, you might be out of the game, right? So if you choose the wrong one. So as far as I'm concerned, what uh, we're doing now today is basically uh, this no more ego trading. We identify good companies and uh, participate on it uh, during their growth stage and uh, just manage our trades on a day-to-day basis. But uh, a few weeks ago, I was with one of the best uh, fund manager in the Philippines and probably the world is that uh, 
And he probably has about 100 companies in his uh, portfolio globally, and uh, that has been very good for him. And uh, investing in businesses, I think, is uh, most important. It's not an all-in thing. It's basically a diversified portfolio. And uh, from a bottom-up basis, uh, I, I think he's probably similar to what Peter Lynch is all about or Warren Buffett uh, style of uh, investing in publicly listed companies. So what you're saying is that after a certain size, then you have to start thinking about how to investing in real businesses and everything else. That's correct. That's correct. For those guys who are just starting, yes, you, you, you can do your trading or your speculation. But uh, when it goes up to a certain size, you need to be looking at it for a more long term and basically identify the business that you like and just reinvest the, the dividends. On a more positive note, what's the best trade you've ever had? I'll go back to a trade that we went into um, in 2012. This was during the period where um, Lepanto was, was coming out of a, a long consolidation during that period where it was basically in huge neglect, right? And then Goldfields came in and made a joint venture with them. And we were buying it at 34, 35 cents during that period. It gapped up significantly. It was, I think it was like 60, cent, 60 centavos and then came down to about 33, 34 centavos where we were started accumulating and picking it up. And it's my first time to be able to participate in that scale of a of, of a story. This wasn't like a short term trade that we do every day that we're holding it for two to three days at a time. This was a larger, bigger term picture trade, right? And I still remember during that period when we were picking it up at uh, 34, 35 cents and then it started shooting up all the way back up to 60, 60 70 cents. And it was like, wow, I've never experience something like this in my life right by the time it was it, it kept moving it went all the way up to i think it was it was about 180 but we were done by around 120 130 right but if you can think about it that was three four baggers that's my first ever bagger that i've ever seen and it was during those periods that that you realize that wow the impact of such a huge catalyst like this can send share prices uh moving so significantly we've been historically technical analysis people, right? And that's the first time that they expo my exposure towards fundamentals and catalysts and stories. And it was during that time where I had to change my style of trading from sticking to just day-to-day -day trading to looking at bigger picture, looking at bigger stories. Well, in my case, during the early days of the 90s, uh, when I came back from uh, Toronto, and uh, I remember I was reading a book uh, an annual report of a company out in Canada. Uh, the book is uh, American, American Barrick. It's the biggest gold mining company uh, in, uh, in Nevada. I we try to identify a company that has similar uh, ore body. And uh, I remember that uh, at that time we pick, up, we pick up a company called Manila Mining. And we started accumulating it and uh, started promoting it because uh, that company at that time was also doing very well. It's just that what people don't understand is that uh, it was in a neglect stage. Those companies today, uh, that company basically is from uh, two and a half cents and it peaked at around 55 to 60 cents. So those are the 20 baggers which can change uh, a person's life. Uh, but those are the, also the reasons why the next one, basically, we we can lose a lot of money doing the same thing, which happened to us also. As the a common company. denominator between both your stories is that there's some form of catalyst or some form yeah. of development that was playing out. I mean, we've seen Macro Asia last year. Yes. Exactly. exactly. Went up 13, 14 times. Yeah. Two pesos, three pesos went up to as high as 30. That's yeah. right. right. Individually, I think it's suffice to say that you guys have been successful in doing it. The challenge is really when you're looking at other traders and in your own experience, you guys handled a lot of traders throughout your lifetime. How difficult is it for translating what you know, what you think in your mind and sharing it to other people? The thing that, that we talk about on the, on the floor all the time is it's what's most important is that they want to come in and they want to have that open mind mindedness to make the adjustments, to make the changes, to make, to adopt the system that we're trying to teach. Being good in trading is being able to understand your primary objective. Uh, a lot of people will trade reversals. A lot of people will trade neglect. A lot of people will trade penny stocks. And what we say all the time is that you want to be able to do something. You want to be good at something. You have to be able to do it over and over again. There was a quote that, um, that I heard uh, two to three weeks ago. It was, champions do ordinary things better than everybody else. 
in that sense is that you have to learn about the thing that you're doing. What is it that you're really good at? What is it that your system allows you to be able to do? What is it that your thought process allows you to maximize? We can only do so much. We can only take it so far, but you have to take it the rest of the way, right? At the end of the day, it's a decision amongst the direct individual trader that has to say, this is what I want to do. I want to just focus on trading momentum. I want to tra- focus just on trading coils. And if you're good at it, what happens is that every single trade becomes the same. Your expectations become the same. There's no anxiety. You're not, you're not afraid of the markets. You can sleep well at night. You know, One of the guys at uh, COL uh, Trading to Alpha Group, they, they wrote this uh, comment on one of the posts. It, it said, uh, SWAN. SWAN stands for sleep well at night, <laughs> right? So the question was, how much do you deploy? And his answer was SWAN. And I looked back at it and I said, that's, that's like the perfect answer that I've ever, I've ever seen. <laughs> but a lot of people like to be spoon fed. They don't like to think too much on their end. And so what values or what's, what characteristics most likely are, have to be inherent for most traders? Because when you talk about open mindedness, yeah, you, you talk uh, about critical thinking. Yeah, but, because if we if we're forced to spoon feed it to you guys, I mean, that means that if we're gone, what happens, right? As much as we would like to continue to spoon feed you guys, right? At the same time, it's you have to understand why we're giving these companies for the meantime. So we're giving you these companies. What is it that we see? You got to think about it, right? It can't be that. Oh, this is what. Calum Gibbs. Okay, that's all I'm buying. Yeah. Uh, about two weeks ago, one of our traders, uh, senior traders, Jensen, uh, sent us a, a YouTube, uh, and uh, it was all about uh, Ray Dalio's uh, life and work principles. It's uh, eight episodes, 30 minutes, you can finish it. What Ray Dalio was saying is that there are two things that most people should understand very clearly. is that uh, it's all about your ego, the second one is what they call the blind spot uh, barrier. The problem with most traders is because uh, if they're using uh, their ego just to be able to do well, I think they will really have a, such a difficult time basically making it. The other statement about blind spot barrier is because we're all born and raised differently. We're wired differently. And so you need a family or a community to help each other to work with each other and so accountability is very critical so that if you want to become a successful trader you really have to find that community to be able to help you out or else you always goes down we call it the first wheel that uh, you make a lot of money then you lose it back make a lot of money and lose it back until you realize uh, that it's not about you but it's about you know uh, the, the objective of what you're doing the challenge behind a lot of traders is that everybody has different bad habits altogether and it's most likely built over the their entire lifetime on a personal end what's the worst trading habit you guys have worst trading habit for me is when markets are capitulating it's just always too tempting to see whether or not it's the bottom (laughs) and uh getting in too early getting in it's always because you're trying to see whether or not you can buy that bounce right because nobody really knows it's those moments where you see prices selling off five, six, seven straight days, and you're like, this is, must be it, this must be it. And you're trying to be the one to outsmart the markets. And then you're the one that always gets crushed because it's not over yet. So me, I think my, my biggest problem is that sometimes we just get in, you just, it's just too tempting to get in at those periods of time. And you really have to learn how to step aside when it, those things happen, right? Picata. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I don't. I don't know. Actually, I don't know. But mine is. Uh, I always sell too soon. Balik tayo talaga. I remember during the 2008-2009, I bought a company <laughs> at uh, eight pesos. Eight, eight, ten. Eight, ten, and uh, by the end of the day, it was six ninety. What company was this? <laughs> uh, it's a URC. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was trying to pick bottoms on uh, URC because it was being sold down by the major uh, foreign institutional uh, brokers. I remember whenever I... Uh, capitulations, I will always uh, call April and ask April which company is there to... You know, that There's a huge disparity and uh, we can take advantage of. And of course, uh, April was sh- uh, showed me sh- that company, that was URC. 
the sad part is I sold it at 12 and 13 pesos. Made a lot of money, but uh, and then it went up to 200. <laughs> 240? 240. Right? So, Don't worry, it's back down to 100. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the, I think, I think my biggest problem is that I always sell too soon. And, uh, and that's maybe the reason why I survive. All right, great. In less than three words, what advice can you give to aspiring and beginning traders? Kalum Trading Institute. <laughs> the reason why, I mean, it's education. That's really the most important. Um, if you're going to go into battle and you have to experience everything by yourself all over again, it's like essentially reinventing the wheel. It's better for you and it's cheaper for you to go and learn it from other people who have experienced it already. It's like saying, I want to be a chef, but I don't know how to cook. I mean, why don't you go learn how to cook, right? This is something that if you have a means to be able to be able to get experience elsewhere and not make the mistakes other people have made, then why not? Chairman, in three words, <laughs> TUL Financial Group. <laughs> I think for you to become a successful trader or uh, to become successful in any business, you have to stay humble. It's just two words. Stay humble. Are you sure it's not three? No. <laughs> I think for if you stay humble, humility, uh, you will be very successful in your life and also in your trading uh, experiences. All right, guys. Thanks so much. We'll be having a break for a month. We'll see you guys until the next episode. Chairman Lawrence. Thanks. See you guys. Thank you. See you.